All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Katie Naples Mitchell. I'm the program director of the program in criminal justice policy and management here at the Malcolm Wiener Center for Social Policy at the Kennedy School. And we're so delighted to have you all with us today for a wonderful talk this afternoon by Megan Stevenson, uh, our invited guest. Before we get to Professor Stevenson's talk, I'd like to just do a little bit of housekeeping um, and introduce her talk in the context of our broader speaker series this fall, uh, which is on the myths of public safety and in particular a focus on pretrial systems. Um, we had our first event last week and the series will continue this fall with our next date of October 12th. The next three events have been added to our event website. And if you have uh, already if you're here with us today, you already have the link that's, uh, that will go to all of those events in the future, but you are welcome to uh, re-register to have those events added to your calendar going forward. Um, that next event on October 12th uh, is entitled No New Jails, No Old Jails, Charting a Path Forward for Women Detained on Rikers Island, featuring three speakers, Andrea James of the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls, Sharon White Harrigan of the Women's Community Justice Association, and Vincent Chiraldi, uh, of the Columbia Justice Lab and a former commissioner of both New York's probation department and the New York City De uh, Department of Corrections. So to begin today, um, some basic housekeeping of how we run our events here. Uh, Professor Stevenson is going to give a talk um, with prepared slides, but also will invite your feedback and participation throughout. And we ask just that you remain muted during the course of the talk and uh, input your questions or comments in the chat, which will be live throughout the duration. If you have resources to share or other insights or questions to ask, please feel free to drop those in the chat or to raise your hand using the Zoom hand raise function, um, which is in the uh, reactions uh, toolbar down at the bottom. And um, we will then pause and have a brief kind of moderated conversation to, to get us going and then take questions, which you all can ask yourselves. Um, and we would love all of that participation, uh, excuse me, participation. So please feel free and encouraged to, to join in whenever the moment strikes. This event is being recorded and the recording will be posted on our YouTube channel after the fact with the live transcription captioning um, and all of that will be hosted on our website as well. So without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce Professor Stevenson. Megan Stevenson is an economist and a professor of, with criminal justice scholar at the University of Virginia School of Law. Her research areas of focus include bail and pretrial and algorithmic risk assessments, as well as misdemeanors and juvenile justice. Her research has been cited uh, in high profile impact litigation around bail systems in Harris County, Texas, um, as well as in numerous academic journals. And we're just so delighted that she's here, not only to talk about some of her really salient findings about bail and pretrial detention, but also preview some new research with us this afternoon. So thank you and welcome and take it away. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to speak with you guys today. First of all, when I hear you talk, like read through my bio, I'm always like, oh God, why did I write those dumb things? I really should just be like, my name is Megan and I like to do nerdy things with data and I like to think about the criminal justice system a lot. That's pretty much all you need to know about me. <laughs> um, and that's pretty much all I've been doing for the last uh, 10 years or so. So a lot of my research has been about bail and all of the you know things connected with bail, risk assessment, so on and so forth. Um, for today, I'm just going to highlight uh, I, probably mostly just three papers that I've worked on in this area that I'm hoping might be of interest uh, to you guys. Um, so I am, I'm also hoping that you'll feel comfortable to raise your hand if you have any clarifying questions, you don't really understand the point I made, or if, if you, uh, you know, uh, just want to kind of build off on, on, you know, want me to elaborate on something. Um, you know, it's always, uh, I think more interesting at a talk when it's a little bit dynamic, there's a little bit of interaction as opposed to just listening to me, uh, you know, yap for, for 30 or 40 minutes straight or however long I'm supposed to talk for. So I'm going to go ahead and share my slides. There we go. Oops. Starting at the top here. So the costs and consequences of bail and pre-child detention, that's kind of the theme of where we're going. So I wanted to start actually with a sneak preview of some new work that I've been doing. Uh, this is a, a paper that I'm 
been having a lot of fun with. It's not out yet. This is actually the first time that I think I've presented it publicly. Uh, it's a, and it's a paper called Failures to Appear. And it's a, a project with uh, Lindsey Graff, Orly Oos, and Sandy Mason. So uh, let me start. Hold on one second. Let me see if I can do from... Hmm. We tried to figure this thing out. Actually, you know what? I think I'm going to have to... Let me pause. Stop share. I had some cool idea. I was trying to figure out the display view so you see you can see the presenter view and the audience sees the regular thing. I think that was a fail because I realized I, I didn't set it up to be able to um, do the reveal. So I'm going to start with the share again. Go back to basic. There we go. Okay. Sorry about that. So why do we have bail and pretrial detention? So let's just start with the ba this basic question. Why do we have these things? Um, the traditional answer has been Two reasons. One, to ensure appearance in court. So we have bail and pre-child detention to get people to show up in court. And two is to prevent crime. So we're going to talk, uh, you know, I'm going to start off by talking about this first thing, this idea of ensuring appearance in court. Now, I'm going to start off with a really basic question. Maybe it's so simple we don't even need to, to, to state it, but let's state it anyway. So why do we need defendants to appear in court? Well, uh, you can't have a criminal proceeding without them, right? So to the extent that the criminal proceeding has social value, you know, that this is something that we're doing, you need people to show up to have it. And if they don't show up, you can't have the criminal proceeding. It wastes everyone's time. You got to reschedule it, you know, the time hassle, et cetera, dysfunction of, of, of the court. So that's why we need defendants to appear in court. Like that's just the basic thing. So obvious it rarely even gets mentioned. But isn't this also true of many other people, right? In order to have a criminal proceeding, it's not just the defendant that you need to show up. You need everybody to be there. You need lawyers, you need police officers, you need victims or other witnesses. You need the whole group of people that you know all together are the ensemble cast that make the criminal proceeding occur. Um, and so this, this new paper that I'm, I'm, I'm working on is addressing this issue of failures to appear by all these other people, everyone besides the defendant. So we're going to start off with just a few basic facts. So non-defendant FTA, and by that I mean failure, you know, failing to appear for at least one, um, uh, at least one hearing per case is rampant. This now I'm talking lawyers, I'm talking uh, police officers, witnesses, um, and victims. It's rampant. Uh, the, the rate of non-defendant FTA is more than twice the rate of defendant FTA. So let's take a closer look at that. Let's break out this group of uh, non-defendants into these different constituent actors. And when you see even at these different constituent actors, officers fail to appear at a substantially higher rate than defendants. Victims fail to appear in more than half the cases. Other types of witnesses fail to appear also in more than half the cases. And finally, defense attorneys, at least in our setting, this is Philadelphia, uh, fail to appear in, in about 16% of cases. By the way, for those that are curious, this is primarily uh, private attorneys, public attorney, I mean, uh, public defenders also fail to appear, but at a, at a much lower rate. Um, in our setting, prosecutors mostly did not fail to appear. That might have been um, some of the structural ways of how prosecutors can kind of stand in for each other in the courts. Um, so what happens? So first of all, this is a widespread phenomenon. This is this is a, a you know much much bigger than just a defendant issue. What happens when people fail to appear? When one of these non-defendants uh, fail to appear in court? What we find is that when an officer, victim, or other witness fails to appear, cases are often just dropped. So what this graph is showing you is um, the rate of uh, so this black bar here is the fraction of cases that are dismissed or, or withdrawn. Pro basically, mostly it's the prosecutor decides to you know stop pursuing them. Uh, this light gray area over here is is the fraction of cases that result in a in a conviction, and then there's a handful of acquittals in there. So mostly it's just it's either conviction or or uh, the prosecutor decides to uh, to dismiss. Basically, if if a non-defendant actor usually a witness, uh, you know, an officer, victim, or witness, fails to appear, the case gets dropped more than twice as often as when uh, there is no FTA and everybody shows up. So 
This is just some, uh, you know, some interesting facts. There's, I think there's a few takeaways that we, you know, that we infer from, from this data. So first of all, let's just start, start with some, you know, some of the, you know, some, some of the inconsistencies. In our country, we have a massive legal and institutional apparatus to ensure appearance in court. So in recent decades, this has consisted of, of money bail and pretrial detention predominantly. This is like the standard, classic, conventional bail system that many people on this call have been uh, fighting to reform. Now, the bail reform movement has slow, you know, so far not questioned that goal, it, not, at least not in a deep way. Mostly it's promoted new methods of ensuring appearance. Like instead of money bail, we use text message reminders. Instead of pre-child attention, we have pre-child service agencies or transportation vouchers that sort of left this idea, you know, solid that there's uh, that's this important need to get defendants to appear in court, and moreover, you know that that uh, you know that there is that this this need is focused primarily on defendants and not on these other actors. But to the extent that appearance is so important, why do we have this extreme asymmetry with respect to getting defendants to appear? The point of this paper is that to the extent that you need people to show up in court to make it work, this is a systemic issue, not a defendant issue. Now, we're not trying to collapse all distinctions. We're not trying to say that, uh, well, we need to start having money bail for the, for the victims and we need to start detaining witnesses. Uh, this is not, you know, the, uh, we're not trying to do a, a par for par. We're certainly not trying to ratchet up to a, a you know, to a, a, a worse status quo. We're just trying to introduce, we're trying to broaden the dialogue on this uh, on this topic, because it matters, you know, when when uh, you know, part of part of how people experience the criminal proceeding, when it is chaotic, when it is disruptive, when they have to go over and over again, when the you know the police officer officer fails to appear, and they need to reschedule their case, you know, for a month later, and they need to take another day off court, and they need to show back up again, it's it's hassle, it's dysfunction, it it help creates this this feeling of. Uh, and, and not just this feeling, this reality of, you know, the system is is currently not working. This system does not respect my time. The system does not respect me, does not respect the process. Um, I want to say one other thing, and this is just a tiny aside. Historically, so today this feels like, oh, weird. You know, why would you, uh, you know, it, it feels natural to think of this as very different. Like, of course, we have a big system to ensure defendants' appearance to court and, you know, and have virtually no system for everybody else. It wasn't always that way. A couple hundred years ago, at the time of the founding, you had to, uh, defendants were bailed out. And by the way, at this time, in this era, bail doesn't mean paying money in order for release. Bail means basically promising that you would owe money uh, if you fail to appear, it's more like unsecured bail, plus having some uh, some sureties or some some friends or family or community member willing to vouch for you. The exact same process was present not just for the defendant, but also for the victim, also for the witnesses. Everybody was bailed out. It was really treated very symmetrically. I don't, we don't know exactly where in history this shifted to this this extreme uh, asymmetry, but I, I think it's just kind of interesting from a historical point of view. All right, the second takeaway here. Victims often don't want to participate in the criminal proceeding, at least not the criminal proceeding as it currently exists. Victims failed to appear at more than 50 percent uh, for, for more than at least for at least one hearing in more than 50 percent of the cases. Um, and when they do, prosecutors often just just drop charges. Uh, or, or when any you know, victim or an officer or, or, or another bit, um, witness uh, fails to appear, they, they often just drop charges. Dismissal is more than twice as likely when you have a non-defendant FTA. Um, I think what comprehensively this, this demonstrates is that the typical approach of addressing social harm through prosecution and punishment is not working in these cases. Like this is the idea, I mean, the classic idea that you maybe learned in you know, your first year 1L criminal law class that you know what? You know well, there's a social harm that occurs. In order to remedy that harm, you first adjudicate them for guilt and innocence, and once they're adjudicated guilty, you sentence them. You know, <laughs> according to retributivist or consequentialist rationales, maybe even to bring wholeness back to the community. You know, so that's the that's the kind of classic line with the criminal justice system. So first of all, <laughs> victims are not interested in that process. 
as it currently exists, given all of the various reasons, the threats they might feel, the you know, the, the, the for good reasons, you know, they might be interested in the ideal. They're not interested in the reality of that process. And prosecutors are not committed to that process, uh, you know, uh, enough to impose the extra burdens on on victims or or uh, or witnesses to to uh, to make them show up. Their you know their response is okay. Well, if if you don't want to do it, we're not doing it. it that's more or less what it looks like. Um, which just means to the extent that there are these social harms that arise from crime that need to be addressed in some way, the current system is 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 you know is uh, is not working <laughs> as well as people had hoped. It supports arguments that society should maybe consider some other approaches. All right, oops. Once again, a sharing fail, screen sharing fail. But let me take a quick moment um, before I go on. Does anybody have anybody have any questions? This is this is kind of the end of this paper. I'm going to move on to discuss a new paper. It was just a very high of you know high level of overview of some of these issues. Um, Felix, hi. Uh, thank you for sharing that information. It's really interesting. I am curious. You uh, mentioned a couple of times that when a non-defendant um, fails to appear, the dismissal rate goes up. Uh, what is the effect on the dismissal rate of a defendant failing to appear? I am trying to remember. I don't think it's any. I don't think it's any effect, but I don't remember because that's not really the focus of the paper. We're really trying to focus more on on um, the impact of these, uh, mostly these police officers, victims, and witnesses. That's a great question. Thank you. Anybody else? I just dropped a link in the chat um, to an example of a report that was done by Court Watch New Orleans about a problem of the New Orleans DA's office arresting victims and witnesses when they uh, did not want to participate in prosecutions, just to show the, the, the kind of harmful downsides of the alternative kind of uh, counterfactual you raised of, you know, we're not trying to necessarily ratchet up, right? Your takeaway is maybe the system actually isn't solving the, or responding to harm in the way that victims want, as opposed to the solution might be to, to restore that kind of common law notion of unsecured bond for everybody, which in some jurisdictions has been, has been turned into default warrants, right? Warrants for failures to appear for everybody, which creates its own sequelae of a lot of external harms. <laughs> Thanks for adding that. Uh, Patricia. Hi, thank you. Fascinating talk. Um, am I right that you did not uh, conduct in this study any qualitative research, meaning understanding the reasons for all these parties to not appear? Uh, I mean, you so mentioned we've done, some for the, sorry. My co-authors have been working closely. This is all uh, data from Philadelphia. They've been working closely with the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office um, so the qualitative research has sort of extended to the uh, the district attorney's office and and police officers, uh, Philadelphia police officers. And you know, at least I think we have the best. We've done the most research so far on what the police officers have to say about why they're failing to appear. And I think it boils down to a couple of things. Um, so one, they are uh, sometimes they fail to appear. They, in a general sense, they don't really mind coming to court. When they don't like coming to court is when they feel like they're on the spot. When they're going to be challenged, when they're going to be made to look a fool, uh, they don't like being cross-examined. Is a short story. So when they they feel threatened by cross-examining, that's one one reason not to come. Sometimes it's just scheduling things. You know, they 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 wanted to go on vacation, they wanted to have a weekend, they wanted to do a thing, and they're like, oh, I'm not going to court again. I'm just not doing it. Um, and then the other reason that was brought up was, uh, or there's two other reasons. One is that sometimes the communications, you know, the like most criminal legal systems, the infrastructure is a disaster, you know, so like the computer systems are out of date. So they don't always know when they have, when they've been subpoenaed, sometimes that doesn't get to them properly. Um, and then the last one they mentioned is, well, sometimes, and this is where, you know, there's some kind of reverse causality question. Sometimes we just don't show up because we know that we really think the prosecutor is going to drop the case anyway. We don't want to waste our time. Um, so that's, those are the kind of sets of explanations they've given. Uh, in terms of victims not failing, you know, and and bystander witnesses, I think a lot of it is, it's hassle. You, you don't want to, you know, it's 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 uncomfortable. Um, it's uh, that my my guess is that that's that's more the set of reasons. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Great questions. Um, okay. So I'm going to. Uh, 
uh, I'm going to go on, I guess, and um, talk a little bit more about these other uh, these other papers, and then we can return, you know, at the end to kind of do a, a bigger Q and A session. Okay. All right. So I'm going to switch gears. So this we're talking about a new paper now. This is Does Cash Bail Deter Misconduct? This is a paper that's uh, co-authored with um, uh, Orly Oos and is forthcoming uh, in the American Economic Journal of Applied Economics. Um, so this is, you know, this is a paper where the title kind of gives it all away. This is, <laughs> that's what we're asking here. Does cash bail serve its intended purpose, which is incentivizing release defendants to appear in court? So, you know, the idea behind cash bail is not, oh, well, if you have cash bail, you can set it at a really high level to keep people locked up and therefore you can ensure that they appear, you know, appear in court that way. I mean, certainly that is done in practice, um, but in, uh, you know, at least in theory, the idea is it's amount of money that can facilitate release. And once you've got some, you know, money on the table, you're more likely to show up because you don't want to lose that money. That's the, that's the theoretical rationale behind bail. Uh, you know, that's the reason we have it, or at least that's the, 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 the reason people point to when, you know, they ask, why do we have it? So um, in order to answer this, we evaluate the impact of uh, uh, Larry Krasner's no cash bail policy. There's another paper set in Philadelphia. Uh, and this is a policy that he implemented not long after he took office, where he declared that prosecutors are no longer going to request cash bail for most offenses. Um, so we looked at what happened after the no cash bail policy was implemented. And uh, the first thing that we find is that there's a sharp reduction in the use of cash bail. Sorry for that typo. Um, so this is a kind of a technical graph here, but the way you think about it is this dotted line right here refers to the time at which the policy was implemented. And this is just kind of like a time trend around normal, uh, you know, kind of before the policy was implemented and then right after the, the policy was implemented. What you what you, can, you can see is, you know, cash bail was, or the, the likelihood of assigning cash bail to a, to a defendant um, kind of followed a fairly normal trend up until uh, this decree. And then there was a sharp drop of about 15 percentage points in the likelihood of, uh, you know, that a defendant would have cash bail set on their case. Um, so we're, we're kind of leveraging this change in the likelihood of, of receiving cash bail to, to answer this research question. Um, the first thing that you should note is that despite a large drop in asking for cash bail, there was no impact on pretrial detention. So to the extent that that's the margin you're interested in, which certainly, you know, <laughs> I think would be the margin many people are interested, no impact on pretrial detention. So you might be like, okay, why not? How does that make sense? Mostly what happened uh, was there was a substitution of no bail instead of low cash bail. So instead of the, the idea is that you're switching from people that would have had bail in the hundreds or kind of a couple thousand dollars towards people, towards giving them um, no bail instead. So we're, we're not making a shift on the higher end of the bail spectrum. We're only seeing a shift on this the, the bail of the spectrum that's $5,000 or less. And in Philly, you can pay a 10% deposit in order to be released. So that's a, uh, you know, a, a, a deposit, paying a deposit of $500 or less in order to be released. Um, and obviously there are some people who can't afford to pay $500. So that doesn't preclude, you know, the possibility of, of seeing an impact on pre-child detention. But as it turns out, it mostly targeted people who would have been able to pay their way out anyway. Um, so what what this allows us to do, so this is for this is the first kind of takeaway of the, the piece, but it also allows us to test whether low cash bail, this, this five thousand dollar or less amount, incentivizes appearance in court or deters crime. Because you have a group of people that they were released before the reform, they would have been, you know, they would have been released after the reform. The big difference now is that they're being released without cash bail instead of being released on low cash bail. And what we find is that there was no uh, impact on failures to appear and uh, no impact on recidivism. So the, the takeaway here is that these, um, well, first of all, discretionary reform may not affect pretrial detention, has no teeth. <laughs> and second, uh, cash bail does not deter failure to appear, at least not for uh, this, this group being studied, which are you know this targeted with these kind of lower, lower bail amounts. 
Now, just to kind of put this in context, these, you know, bail in the amounts of, you know, a couple thousand dollars, that is really kind of the modal bail amount in the United States. You know, there are a lot of people detained pretrial, absolutely. But the modal defendant is released and they're released onto bail in these kind of low to middling amounts. Um, they're released either because they you know, bailed out with the bondsman or they were able to come up with a deposit themselves or somebody loaned them money. So this is, um, you know, I think this is, this is not answering all of the questions you'd want to answer about, pre, you know, about cash bail, but it's answering a question that's really central to it. You know, we have this system that is imposing these, these requirements um, on a large group of people and apparently opposing them uh, largely unnecessarily. So why not? You know, you, we're, you know, I'm an economist, right? I'm still thinking kind of in a practical sense, like people respond to incentives, right? Like nobody wants to lose money. Why does this not have an impact? And I think that, you know, there, there are a couple ways of looking at it. So first of all, there are already penalties for failing to appear, you know, like on top of, you know, it's already, it's already going to result in a bench warrant. It's already going to result in a greater likelihood of you being detained next time. Um, you know, it's technically, it's a crime to fail to appear. Uh, but moreover, it, you know, it's, it's, this is a money bail, at least the theory behind money bail is, is, is assuming that there's some intentionality in failing to appear in court. And when people are behaving intentionally, sometimes you can get them to behave otherwise by adjusting their incentive structure. But when they're failing to appear in court because they are, uh, you know, either the system is too complicated and they don't understand when and where they're supposed to appear, or they're, you know, dealing with a variety of issues in terms of um, you know, their own life instability, uh, you know, housing instability, sometimes mental health or substance abuse issues. It's, it's just not intentional. Um, and, uh, you know, so these kind of incentive-based systems are, are not going to be, are not going to be effective. Um, all right. So I think that's, uh, that's the last slide that I have on, on this. Um, so I, uh, you know, again, I'm going to take a pause and see if there's any questions about this paper before moving on to, um, the third one that I'm, uh, I guess I'm talking about four today, so <laughs> we'll see how much I get to before. All right, we're going to go on, go on right on. Okay, so this one is called Pre-Child Detention and the Value of Liberty. It's co-authored with Sandy Mason. Um, now I'm, we're flashing back up to the beginning of this talk. So we started off with why do we have bail and pre-trial detention? Traditionally, for two reasons, ensuring appearance in court, preventing crime. Earlier, we were talking about the first prong, ensuring appearance in court. Now let's talk about the second prong, the idea that you have pre-child detention to prevent crime, because otherwise, if you release people, they'd go out and do really bad things. So that's a, I think this is in practice something that is, uh, you know, a, a, the reason that gets pointed to, to explain a large portion of our, uh, you know, of our pre-child detention population. But it begs the question, okay? It begs the question, if we're going to detain people to prevent crime, how dangerous do they need to be able to justify pre-child detention? We don't, for, we don't know what's going to happen in the future for anybody. Everybody at least has some theoretical prob, you know, possibility that they might commit crime in the future. We all have you know, some theoretical possibility we might commit crime in the future. Um, we're not arguing that everybody should get locked up. In the spectrum of, quote, dangerousness, where do you draw the line? And this really comes into focus if you start talking about adopting these risk assessments. You build a risk assessment. You predict the likelihood that people are going to, you know, commit or not commit crime in the future. They're going to be rearrested or whatever it is, whatever the measure. And eventually you've got to draw a line in the sand, right? Or they do draw a line in the sand. They say, okay, this is low. This is moderate. This is high. We've ranked everyone according to risk. We've decided this is high. Low people can get released. You know, moderate people get whatever they get. They get a um, electronic monitoring, pre-child supervision, and high-risk people need to be detained because they are high risk. Now, when you draw that line in the sand, you're effectively answering that question. You're providing your own answer of how dangerous someone needs to be to be able to justify pre-child detention. But that answer, that question, this question almost never gets asked. It no more, it almost never gets any serious attention. Uh, you know, people, when I see drawing the line in the sand, you need to, in order to implement a risk assessment, if you're going to pair any risk 
assessment with recommends, recommendations for detention as they do all the time when they adopt them, they're effectively answering this question, but they're not doing so in an explicit way. There's, there's been almost no clear conversations about how to do it in an explicit way. I'm going to rephrase, uh, you know, how we, how to, uh, one way of answering that question, which is if incarcerating 10 people for one month each prevents one serious crime, is it worth it? How do you answer that? I mean, at first you're like, that feels like a really hard question to answer. Maybe we just can't answer this. I don't know. So the goal, uh, you know, the goal in this paper is to try and take a stab uh, at answering this. And I'm going to start with, I'm going to start with the rationale that we use for answering this. And this is not a rationale that, this is, this is not us being like, this is the right way to do it. This is us reading the law, reading, you know, Supreme Court doctrine, reading statutes, trying to see what other people say. The legal doctrine suggests that the rationale for preventive detention, for incarcerating somebody solely to prevent crime, basically boils down to a cost-benefit analysis. You know, that you, you detain when the uh, benefit of averted crime outweighs the, the, the costs in terms of lost liberty. Um, and figuring out exactly, you know, how much liberty to, oops, to trade for you know, to some safety is is ultimately if you take this this principle that is is the only one that really gets put forward to to justify pre pre uh, preventive detention. If you take this seriously, the question boils down to how much liberty are you willing to trade for, uh, you know, for some amount of safety. Um, once again, you know, nobody is saying, well, we should we need to detain people pretrial because they're probably guilty and they should be punished. That might be effectively what's going on, but that's not what they say. They say, we do it because, uh, you know, in the interest of society, we, this is for the greater good, for the greater good, despite their, you know, presumed innocence, uh, you know, their, their, their risk of committing crime is so great that, that it's for the greater good of society that we lock them up. All right, so the, the way we do this is, uh, is fairly straightforward. Um, we conduct a survey, and the survey... Uh, it consists of questions such as this. So if you had to choose between spending a year in jail or being the victim of a burglary, which would you choose? Or if you had to choose between spending a day in jail or being the victim of a burglary, which would you choose? Now, I think a lot of people say, well, this, this, you know, until you start framing it in specific questions like this, people are like, oh, you just possibly can't compare the cost of lost liberty against the cost of crime, it's too different, it's too impossible. As a matter of fact, I don't actually think it's that hard. Let's start with this first question. Think for yourself, if you had to choose between spending a year in jail or being the victim of a burglary, both of which are awful things, right? Both of which are awful things, which would you choose? As it turns out, almost everybody says being a victim of a burglary. So if you're, <laughs> you may be in good, in good company there. As you get kind of closer in, it gets a little bit harder to say. So if you choose, have to choose between spending a day in jail or being the victim of a burglary, as it turns out, a lot of people are kind of on the fence about that. Some people say yes, some people, you know, some people choose the jail, some people choose the burglary. Uh, and, and it, uh, but, but that, as it turns out, is the median response. So if, we ask, uh, we ultimately ask this question, how much time in jail is, is as bad as being the victim of whichever crime? It turns out that the median respondent says a burglary is about as bad as one day in jail, robbery is about as bad as three days in jail, and a serious assault is about as bad as a month in jail. So that's, that's what we found out based on asking a bunch of people. Some people are a little higher. Some people are a little bit lower. Almost nobody is saying, you know, uh, numbers that are that are really vastly different from these, though. So a few takeaways so so far. First of all, according to our respondents, jail is horrible. Nobody wants to go to jail. It's perceived even short periods of time in jail are perceived as being as harmful as serious serious crimes. What this boils down to is in order to justify preventive detention on this cost benefit basis, there must be a very high risk of serious crime. In order to justify imposing harms as grave as, uh, as incarceration on somebody, uh, 
you need to be preventing so you need to be preventing something very serious and with a you know with a very high probability um just to to put this kind of in in a little bit more specific numbers in order to justify one month of preventive detention you would need to avert crimes as grave as an aggravated assault now even the, if you look at risk assessment tools you know which rank people according to their risk even those in the highest risk category have only a 2% chance of being arrested for a violent crime within a month. This is way, this is way smaller than the, you know, the numbers that we said would be necessary to justify preventive detention on this kind of cost benefit basis. The truth is that we don't have the predictive tools. We simply cannot predict with any great accuracy who is going to commit serious crime in the near future. The takeaway is that pre-child detention on the basis of dangerousness, it should be exceedingly rare if you take the rationales, this kind of cost-benefit rationale seriously. If you think the rationale should be something else, go ahead and explain what it is. <laughs> but it's it's really hard to justify uh, you know, preventive detention on any other basis without trampling deeply on uh, you know, um the presumption of innocence or you know the or 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 due process, you know, the uh, the due, due process requirements. Um, so, okay, once again, I'm going to, I'm going to pause and, and take questions. This is, a, I think, a conceptually complicated paper. I've swept some things under the rug. Uh, I've, I've simplified some things that are more complicated, you know, um, so I think, I, I feel like there are almost certainly people in the audience being like, well, what about, and I don't really understand why she did it this way. So feel free to jump in. Um, even if your question is only kind of half formed in your mind. I'll ask a question. Thank I'm, you. I'm an expert at half formed questions. <laughs> um, so I just think this is interesting because I've often thought this, that, you know, this is sort of leaning towards an actuarial view of cost, this sort of a cost benefit. Um, but when you look at things like uh, uh, prison sentences and bail amounts, if we really took an actuarial view of these things, you would your bail amount would be four hundred and thirty seven dollars and eighteen cents. Like it, you know, my my car insurance doesn't come in five hundred, seven hundred and fifty. You know, it it is so um, calculated. But it's very precise. And so it just says, it has always said to me that those things like prison sentences, where they're like a year, two years, you know, they're not based on a calculus of benefit, cost benefit. They're just set at these big chunks of, of time. Yeah. So I think that's a really, a really great point. And I, and I would say that a one takeaway from this paper is that the theories that are put forth to justify preventive detention can't possibly be what's really, you know, what's really deciding things here. Yeah. Because if the theories that were, were put forward to justify preventive detention were put into practice, we would have a very, very small number of people that are detained pretrial on the basis of dangerousness. Yeah. In reality, We've got hundreds of thousands of people detained pretrial on, on any day, and a large number of them, um, I believe, are there because they, uh, you know, the, at least based on the, you know, the dialogue or, around bail reform and the things that people say, a large, a large part of that rationale is because they are considered too risky, too dangerous, too prone to commit some new crime to release. So when theory doesn't meet practice, the theory is not, this is, the, you know, this, this is not the the theory is not explaining the reality very well. Um, you know, our, our best, uh, you know, to the extent that there is some cost benefit kind of weighing back and forth, what appears to be going on is that judges are discounting the well-being of detainees. They're discounting those harms. They're saying those harms don't really matter. Um, and maybe, you know, there's a variety of reasons why they could be doing that. They could be doing that because uh, they've prejudged them as guilty. And certainly some of the people are guilty. So it's not on a deep level, you know, crazy or irrational, but it also is, 
uh, not consistent with, you know, the presumption of innocence. It's to terribly problematic to allow somebody to detain someone because they think they're kind of, I think they're kind of probably guilty. That, that, that's something that we should be very, very concerned about. Obviously, there's also race. There's, you know, there's, there's all, all the various types of othering that goes on. You know, the people that come in front of judges tend to come from very different backgrounds and communities than the judges uh, themselves. Um, but yeah, so I, I, I think in addition to your point about this, you know, at these, a true a kind of actuarial cost benefit type analysis would yield a bunch of things that don't remotely resemble the world that we live in. Yeah. And so if, you know, to the extent that, that this theory doesn't the theory doesn't support our practice. I think it's important to, to make a real inquiry into what's actually going on and to the extent the society is comfortable with and can condone what's going on. Sarah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, this has been so, so interesting. Um, I'm wondering if you've done any research on um, with the rise of electronic monitoring and how, um, at least in Illinois, starting in January, they're gonna abolish cash bail how we can sort of apply these same arguments to electronic detention or sort of e-jail and how I think while, at least, you know, in my view, it's the same, the argument applies just the same, whether it's pretrial, you know, e-detention or uh, physical jail detention, how we can get those people on board um, in the sort of electronic context and how we can apply these arguments to that, to that I context. I think that's a, that's a really great question. And I, I think, so this I mean, on a, on a basic level, what we've done is like almost like a little kid's game. It's the would you rather game. You know, would you rather spend a week in jail or be the victim of a robbery? You know, so it feels sort of unsophisticated. But at the same time, <laughs> let me tell you that almost all of the estimates of the cost of crime that are used in almost all types of policy analyses, you know, of, you know, was this, did this pass the cost benefit test, so on and so forth. All of those also came from basically a would you rather game also. So contingent valuation is the formal word for the method. What we're doing is basically contingent valuation. Contingent valuation is the formal method of deriving monetary estimates of the costs of crime or the costs of any other non-market good, you know, um, clean air, for instance, or whatever. Uh, here, uh, but ex except here we're sort of measuring the cost of crime in jail days instead of in dollars. Uh, but it's it's conceptually the same thing. So this basic method is very flexible and it can be used to evaluate the relative harms of a variety of different things. In your context, it might be so so, you know, electronic monitoring creates a certain amount of harm. You know, it's it has costs. It has costs in terms of liberty. So the relevant question would be: how do we quantify those costs against whatever the relevant benchmark is. You know, it might be, you know, against uh, against the experience of crime. You could ask, you know, how, you know, how many days in electronic monitoring is equally as bad as being the victim of, you know, uh, a robbery or a burglary, or how many days of electronic monitoring is, is equally as bad as, you know, a week in jail or something like that. So I think that the method is flexible and I think it, it allows in a kind of like, Obviously, it strips down a lot of stuff. You know, this is a simplistic method, but I think it focuses on some some core questions and allows you to kind of balance uh, these kind of non uh, balance these different types of harms against one another, and which I think can, is often an informative exercise. Felix, yeah, thank you. Um, I really appreciated this uh, style of reasoning and I found this really compelling. One of the things I wanted to ask about, um, since you bothered to collect all this information about sort of how people think about the costs of crime was about variation in the responses and sort of how people might be responding based on their expectations. I know work by people like Eva Pager has shown that like my getting a criminal record as a black person means a very different thing than another person having that same experience. Um, and, you know, some people might not have any sense of what jail actually means um, to, you know, to, like they've never been to one or never had that experience um, and et cetera, et cetera. So I was curious, like, to what extent that came up and might be sort of, uh, yeah. I don't think it's going to change the takeaway in any meaningful sense. I'm just curious if there's any takeaways from that. Yeah. So, so that's a really, that's a really great question and something we were also very curious about. As it turns out, so let me answer this in kind of two ways. I, at a first glance, people's responses looked pretty similar 
across demographics, across race, across gender, across age, across income, across, um, you know, whether or not you've got prior experience with incarceration or prior experience with crime victimization. So this is a first glance look. And what I mean by that is, uh, you know, in the raw data, it looks pretty similar. I'm almost certain there would be differences. And if we had a much bigger data set, we might be powered to be able to detect, to detect these differences. But the first glance impression is that there is not, the median response across almost every subgroup was, was very similar or only differed by a day or two. Um, the second thing that I wanted to highlight here is that I, I think there, there's one group that we were, or, or two technically subgroups that we were particularly interested in. And these were people that had firsthand experience with crime or firsthand experience with incarceration, given that, you know, something about, you know, it's one thing to speculate not having done it. Not that we have zero knowledge. You know, we, you know, most people know people who have experienced crime or incarceration. We certainly have, you know, knowledge through media, through books, through TV or through whatever, through, you know, social media. But having firsthand knowledge is different. Um, and so we, you know, we looking at the subgroup of people that had firsthand knowledge, uh, uh, you know, of these of these different types of harms. And again, the trade-off looked very similar to to everybody else, which made us feel, I think, a little bit more, more comfortable with these results. Uh, the second thing is that this is not a perfect, you know, there's there's this is not a perfect method. You know, we I think we've there's there's some, you know, depending on the exact sample, it could change a little bit, the time period, the exact, you know, phrasing in question, I think that the answers could change a little bit. But they would, in order to change the main point of this paper, which is jail is horrible, in order to, since we can, uh, since we're bad at prediction, in order to justify pre preventive detention on the basis of dangerousness, they would have to be so, you know, the risk would have to be so high and the crime would have to be so grave uh, that that's the only instance in which it would be justified. You would, <laughs> the our, our our S, you, you would have to, we would have to be so far off in order to overturn this result because the result is, is, is really quite, uh, you know, the takeaways are, are kind of overwhelmingly saying that um, pre-child detention should be extraordinarily rare. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, all right, so I'm going to defer to the moderators here. It's 5:20. Uh, I could talk briefly about risk assessment, or we could just go switch to um, to Q and A mode. I think we had one more question in the chat that I just want to invite um, somebody to ask, which happened a little while ago. Um, oh, thank you. Which was from Patrick Butler. Patrick, do you want to ask your question directly? I, I have a question that I'd like to ask. Okay, go ahead, Sandra. I'll lower my hand, maybe it was obvious. Um, so there a number of jurisdictions have either reduced um, their reliance on bail, cash bail for some set of offenses, or really have, you know, they um have uh essentially kind of rarely use it in most cases. Um, what do we know about the impact of moving? towards re relying less on cash bail on crime, including violent crime. What does the body of research that's been done so far tell us about its impact? Um, does that And does that jive with what it is that you're suggesting here today? So I don't think we know a lot yet. Um, I think the, 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 there is a media narrative that suggests that you know, getting rid of cash bail has led to an explosion in crime. I think that that is massively overstated and, you know, <laughs> and, and pretty much false. Um, and I, I say that partly because there are, um, the number of people that have been released, there are very few places that have seen a, a very large decline in jail populations. The, the, the largest decline in jail populations that we've seen came from COVID policies, a change in COVID policies. This is not coming from bail reform. And obviously so much changed with COVID, it's really hard to infer too much from that era. But beyond the decline in jail populations because of COVID, a lot of 
what we've seen is that bail reform happens and pre-child detention populations just have not changed a lot. Um, there are some exceptions. New Jersey uh, has seen a larger change. Um, uh, a handful of other places as well, but but by and large, there haven't been the types of numbers being released to to just possibly begin to explain, you know, the 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 crime surges that you know, at least in terms of homicide surges that some cities have actually experienced. Um, that being said, you you know, when you release uh, more people, the statist you know the statistical likelihood of the type of crime that occurs on the street does go up like undoubtedly, you know, it, it does go up. Um, th that doesn't mean I'm not, no, not that I'm being a little careful here. Crime also occurs in jail. Very serious crime occurs in jail. Crime occurs in jail all the time. Detaining people doesn't stop crime. It doesn't prevent crime. It shifts crime, you know, from the streets to the jails. Um, so kind of a, a net, a, <laughs> The, you know, the way people measure crime, which is arrests and so forth, uh, largely doesn't apply in jails because jail crime usually doesn't result in an, in an arrest. Um, but you would be, you would be, it would be very foolish to say that that pre-child detention reduces crime in a kind of a net way. Um, but at the same time, I think, you know, to be honest, I think that if you did release, if you did reduce pre-child detention populations quite a bit, a, a certain number of the people that you would release would go on to commit crime. Um, and, uh, and that's, I think that's just kind of a, like, that's a statistical fact. And so sh are, are these crimes that we should be worried about? Cause there are a lot of things that are crimes that yeah. don't really have an impact, a major impact or any impact on public safety. Um, and, and so how much should we worry about that? I think by suggesting that it does, it can lead to crime makes it seem as if we need to really be terribly concerned about public safety. But my sense is that some of those crimes are not things that we should um, worry a lot about because they don't really have a major impact on public safety. So shouldn't that be a part of this conversation? Absolutely. So, I mean, there's, I mean, there's all types of crime. I, I, I but I don't want to say that there's violent crime doesn't occur, you know, like it, it absolutely occurs. It absolutely, if you released, an, you know, Every, if everybody was detained pre-trial was, was released, you know, on a statistical level, you know, there's a, a good likelihood that some of them would commit violent crime. Do you know, the question here though is, do we feel, you know, do we as a society, are we as a society willing to impose the massive harm on the, you know, the thousands, tens of thousands, you know, whatever, if it's looking at city on the hundreds of thousands across the country of people that are detained pre-trial, in order to prevent this other type of harm, which is serious. I'm not, you know, I don't want to trivialize you know, that, that type of crime. A lot of people that are in there, if you release them, they would not engage in serious violent crime. Most of them probably would not engage with seri in serious violent crime. Um, you know, so it's, 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 a, it's a, but to say that there's no trade-offs, that's, you know, like, you, you, that's just not the reality. You know, there are, I think there are trade-offs that need to be considered in, in, you know, in this, in this metric. And now, of course, we've narrowed, like what I've, you know, the frame of this conversation is a narrow one. You know, it's, do we release people or do we, in, you know, do we incarcerate them? If those are your two choices, I'm saying, yes, there are trade-offs. You know, you have, you probably release a bunch of people, you'll, you know, you'll have some more crime on the streets. You incarcerate them, you'll have crime in the jails, and you'll also have the harms of incarceration. Jails are awful, awful places, you know? Um, I don't think that those are the only two options that we as a society have. Uh, you know, I think there, you know, I, I think there are other ways that we can minimize the, you know, there are other ways beyond jail that we can reduce the harms associated with, with crime. Um, and I, you know, I currently there's not a ton of political will to explore, you know, those, those other channels, but we, you know, one can hope that, that we will. And so you're not kind of left with this, like, kind of stark binary that that doesn't really feel great either way. I'd love to put a, a finer point on this with some imperfect numbers, but the numbers that I know that do exist, and this maybe leads into some of your research about risk assessments, because I know um, the public safety assessment, which is the pretrial algorithmic risk tool,
that is used in Kentucky. Can you still hear me? So Megan, perhaps you should go ahead with, yeah, to, to your next. Um, oh, okay. Maybe we'll join us when she gets a chance. All right, sounds good. So this, this paper is called Assessing Risk Assessment in Action. Um, and it looks at what happened when Kentucky uh, made pretrial risk assessment mandatory and set a presumptive default of release for low and moderate risk defendants. Um, so just a little background, uh, you know, you might be like, well, why Kentucky? Kentucky was uh, kind of an early leader in, in bail reform. And the Kentucky model, which is, um, you know, adopting these risk assessments, setting these presumptive defaults of release, trying to reduce the use of monetary bail, has been, I think, the model that many other states have either followed or, you know, kind of considered following. So the, the original California bail reform bill that eventually got, uh, you know, uh, shut down, never got implemented, was, was based on Kentucky's model. Uh, so the first thing that we find is that, you know, judges do seem to be responding to this risk assessment. People rated low risk are more likely to be released. Uh, higher risk people are less likely to be released. Um, and kind of moderate risk people or, or people with a no score are, are kind of somewhere in the middle. Um, but overall, the net impact on pre-child detention rates was not that much. So this is a graph. This is uh, just to kind of walk you through this graph. This dotted red line right here is the date that uh, House Bill 463 was passed. This is the bill that um, made it, uh, you know, declared this, made pretrial risk assessment mandatory and declared this presumptive default of release. Uh, this solid red line is the date it was implemented. So kind of in 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 this in this zone is when you might expect to see the the changes of. Uh, the impact of this this bill to happen. I mean, what you can see is there is, and this right here just shows kind of a time trend in the fraction of defendants that are uh, that are released pretrial. I mean, you can see that there is an increase as a result of this bill, but if you look at the scale over here, the increase is tiny. It's about four percentage points, so a, a tiny bump up in the likelihood of pretrial release, and then it continued on this kind of downward slope that it had been on previously. I, until you know a, a a few years later, when the pretrial release rate was actually lower than it had been after the reform. Um, so this second red line here was the date that Kentucky switched from their uh, their homegrown, their homemade risk assessment to the PSA, which, as many of you know, is you know widely used across the country. It's the, the Arnold Ventures tool. Um, and and here you see you know kind of a, a minuscule, barely detectable little blip up in releases of about a percentage point um, or less. Uh, so you see only a small net increase in releases, uh, but unfortunately, you don't see any benefit in terms of reduced failures to appear or pretrial crime. Um, so this was, uh, you know, this is not the ideal of risk assessment. The ideal of risk assessment is that you're going to be able to have these dramatic gains, you know, either releasing way more people without pretrial crime or or failures to appear going up, uh, or the flip side, you know, um, dramatically lowering pretrial crime or, or failures to appear without uh, releases going up. Um, the second uh, the second thing to note is that this presumptive default, this is, again, this is discretionary reform with no teeth. This is similar to what we saw in the Larry Krasner thing. So in, in the Larry Krasner's you know, bail reform, he told his prosecutors to not ask for cash bail, but prosecutors don't set bail, right? Prosecutors are advisory. Prosecutors are believed to be influential. They are at least somewhat influential, but judges make the call or magistrates technically make the call. Uh, and there, you know, this kind of advisory, discretionary, non-binding reform had very little impact on actual releases. Here, uh, this discretionary reform that set a presumption of release without bail for low and moderate risk defendants, um, which would have been 90% of defendants if, if they had folded, uh, followed it uh, to, to the letter. 90% of defendants would have been uh, released pretrial. Judges overruled or ignored this presumptive default most of the time. So they granted non-monetary release in less than a third of cases where it was recommended. Once again, if you, you know, discretionary reform with no methods of accountability um, and no monitoring is unlikely to have, have a big impact. 
And then finally, um, racial disparities increased as a result of this risk assessment. So this is uh, the likelihood of being granted non-financial release for uh, for white defendants and black defendants. The, the, the white defendants are this um, dotted black line um, up at the top here. You see in, in all instances, their likelihood of being granted release is higher um, than, than black defendants, which is this solid black line here at the bottom. Um, once again, this is the date that uh, HB 463 was uh, was adopted and implemented. And here you can see you know, there's kind of a there's a noticeable gap here, but it's much smaller than the gap up here. Um, uh, and and here's again where the PSA was adopted. Again, here's you know not a real noticeable gap in in terms of of uh, not not a real noticeable change in racial disparities as a result of the PSA. Um, so why did racial disparities increase? Um, and again, you know, when we're asking these questions, you always have to remember you're comparing it to the status quo. So you're you're comparing judicial decisions with risk assessment to judicial decisions without risk assessment. We started off with racial disparities, right? You know, so um, why did they increase? The, the, the answer is a little bit subtle and it's different from what people normally think about when they think about racial disparities and risk assessment. And it's mostly a geographical issue. It's, it's mostly a ge geographical answer in that judges in largely white rural counties responded more. They were more likely to pay attention to this presumptive default of, of release than judges in racially mixed urban counties. Now, if you look just within these counties, so just within urban counties or just within rural counties, judges kind of increased the release rates for black and white defendants by a comparable amount. Um, but it's it's this geographical uh, spread in in use in adoption that really resulted in in the the change in in racial in, in racial disparities that you see when you look across the entire state uh, as a whole. Um, so again, takeaways: nudging judges is kind of this this nudging judges towards reducing pre-child detention rate with non-binding presumptions of release doesn't work. Judges are not going to you know if. If you just kind of give them some recommendations, by and large, they're going to ignore those recommendations unless they are personally invested or they are there's some sort of cost with noncompliance. Um, the impacts of risk assessment depend as much on how judges use the tool as the tool itself. You know, so if uh, the you know the, the, there's too much focus in my mind on the tool, uh, you know, and on the um, you know, the way the tool, the, the recommendations given and too little focus on, you know, judicial discretion. Uh, and ultimately no real, you know, either in this study or it's, you know, it's been, I think, since established in, in other places, there really haven't been any real world evidence of large improvements or even real large changes as a result of, of risk assessment adoption, um, either for the, for the better or for the worse. Uh, all right. I think that's all I got for you. Um, that's terrific. And, and I can jump in to try to kind of resume the question that I'm so sorry, my Zoom crashed. No worries. <laughs> um, but one of the things that I wanted to do was link the question and kind of line of inquiry that you and Sandra were exploring to risk assessment also, right? And thinking about, um, you know, risk assessment tools are deeply flawed. And as you say, can both encode and embed racial disparities and then make them worse to the extent that it involves the discretionary overlay of judicial decision making. Um, but they also, I think, offer something of a useful barometer in thinking about what is the likelihood of pretrial violence, even if you take them at their own terms, right? So one of the, the public safety assessment, for example, uh, predicts that 92% of the people that are flagged for potential violence if released pretrial will not go on to commit a violent crime, right? That, that the, the likelihood of pretrial violence, of a violent crime being committed while somebody is released is very, very small. The vast majority of people are not expected. And that the problem of predictive judgment in the pretrial decision-making space is about identifying among similarly situated people who is the likely person to actually go out and potentially commit a crime, right? Yeah. And so, so going back to Sandra's point and your point earlier about um, Yes, when we talk about questions around reform and the elimination of cash bail or, or th those kinds of questions, there is a risk, but it's a small risk that the kinds of harms we're trying to prevent in particular, right? We're not trying to uh, detain somebody in order to prevent them from 
driving on a suspended license from an unpaid fine or fee, right? That's not the goal, theoretically, of pretrial detention, but that is one of the most commonly prosecuted crimes and the reasons that people get those kinds of arrests pretrial, right? Um, what we're trying to prevent are those much more serious harms. So I, I just wanted to offer that uh, as a link between these two topics. I don't, you're, of course, welcome to react, but I'll drop that statistic in, which comes from a New York Times op-ed that was written by Chelsea Barabas and Colin Doyle and um, and Kardec, uh <clears throat> Dinkar for just that point. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, no, I agree. I mean, the, you know, the, the large majority of people are not going to go on and commit. And, and even those 8%, uh, most of them are committing, they're not committing the more grave types of, of physical harm. I don't, you know, physical, you know, assault is, if you're, if you're being assaulted, it feels grave regardless, you know, so I don't want to trivialize like simple assault or whatever, but, but most of these people are not facing aggravated assault. They're not facing robbery. They're, they're not facing rape or, or murder or the kind of like the, the really, the, the ones that society tends to be deeply scared of. Um, I, you know, I, I, but I, I think I, like, I, I think I'm putting, I'm going to push back on this a tiny bit because I do think there is like in the, in the bail reform movement, there is like a, an unwillingness to discuss or like there's a tendency to sort of trivialize crime or to trivialize the possibility or like an unwillingness to discuss this. And, and I, I, I think everything you're saying is true, but also violent crime is mostly doesn't get, most violent crime doesn't result in arrest. So to the extent that eight, only 8% get rearrested, the true number is higher. You know, whatever it is, we don't know exactly, but it is, it is probably higher than the, than the 8%. There's also people that would argue, well, um, you know, well, yes, I actually do care. You know, there, there's there's been, you know, drug dealing going on outside my house. I got to get my kids to school. I'm uncomfortable just walking. You know, there's like a, there's, you know, always guys out there, you know, like trying to sell drugs in front of my house. I'm uncomfortable. You know, like I, I respect that. Like I, I can see, I don't know that that, you know, I don't know that the solution is locking somebody up. I, you know, I think there's other ways society can address these types of things. But um, I do think it might be a little bit too simple to say that the only thing that, um, you know, uh, the only thing that we, you know, people care about is the serious violent crime. The point that I'm trying to make in my paper, though, is is a little bit different. That, like, even if you know, even if we acknowledge that crime beyond serious violent crime has harms that you know, you know in people's lives, even if we acknowledge that um, you know the official arrest statistics understate the true number of serious violent crimes that are being committed. Um, Incarceration also imposes such incredibly deep, deep, grave, grave harms that imposing this on people that are presumed innocent and really like not just presumed innocent, like, like, you know, as a result of like a 30 second Mickey Mouse hearing in which, a, you know, a judge takes a glance at some evidence and then just like pulls some number out of the hat that the person may or may not be able to afford, which is how we're currently doing it, is, you know, is just a part of the equation that that needs to be taken way more seriously. Um, and if you do take it seriously uh, along with this, um, uh, you know, this, the fact that the only rationale people point to when they justify this is, is basically a, a preventive one, is basically a cost and benefits one. Um, it currently isn't, it currently isn't justified. And what we're doing, I think we, it's, it's just something that is something that should give us a, a much, much deeper pause. Yeah, we've got another question from Felix, and we've got about five minutes left. So folks, feel free to raise your hands or drop questions in the chat, and we'll see how many we can get through in our five minutes. Go ahead, Felix. Hi, uh, and I've already spoken, so I'll try and keep it short. Um, I guess thinking about this like point about being clear that there is a trade-off, um, even if it's one that we're maybe at the very wrong side of right now, <laughs> I guess that raises my question of like, would is it reasonable to apply that framework of there is a trade-off like everywhere then? Because there's, you know, people commit crimes in general, which is sort of the point you're, I think, uh, alluding to where if you release a bunch of people statistically, somebody's going to do something. You could say the same of like college students or like other groups, and there might be sort of like, different degrees of risk. Maybe that 2% is 1% or 3% or what have you. Um, but it seems arbitrary. Um, unless you have like a huge degree of faith in what policing is getting us in terms of like an initial filter on this, which doesn't seem warranted given the accuracy of the predictive tools, right? If that was buying us a lot, then the predictive tools maybe would be actually like these would be the people 
who we think are, you know, should have this framework. And so one, I just want to, I guess, want to raise that, like, okay, we think about this as a trade-off. Is that the sort of thing you would say in another context? If we're talking about, like, what preventative action should we take, given what we understand about who engages in violence, let's say, about age, about um, demographics, about economic access, we'd like, throw all of that into something and then try and, like, make a trade-off there. That trade-off exists and is real, but feels different. And I'm just curious, like, what is, if you would make that same argument there, and if not, why? Yeah. So, and before, so, actually, before you respond, do you mind if we just take the next two questions just in the interest of time so that we can sure. try to give you time to respond to all of them? Yep. So go ahead, Peter Brown, and then Carlos Martinez. Can you hear me? Okay, thank you. Um, I, I'd just like to pro pose a procedural uh, question. If we assume that public defenders have difficulty in interacting with their clients in depth, right at the time of arraignment. Let's just assume, you know, there's a flood of 90 defendants, you have 10 seconds to talk to them, the arraignment is kicked over and this goes on because there's procedural issues about how effective, how easily an attorney, a public defender can talk to their client. Um, uh, so if there's some detention r before that attorney can talk to the client, um, I'm aware that there is some academic evidence that says that if people who are either released right away or have a very short period of detention, like two or three days, when compared to people who have 60 days of detention, um, that there are significantly uh, less FTAs, uh, less uh, pre-adjudication crimes, and uh, recidivism. Um, so I'm just wondering whether we, we, we could uh, discuss that a little bit. Thank you for the question. Let's take our last question from Carlos Martinez. Uh, so my question, I think, you know, the, the most important thing um, that I'm looking at is we're about to roll out the PSA uh, in Miami-Dade County. And the biggest challenge uh, that I find is the challenge having to do uh, with the FTAs that are not intentional, uh, because uh, most of the time in Miami-Dade County, uh, the people who fail to appear get the bench warrant, but they get it aside within two or three days. They get it set aside. Um, so uh, the question, one of the things that you mentioned that was critical for me is the issue of monitoring and the issue of accountability, how important those two things are and if you can explain a little more about that uh, and the issue of FDAs not being intentional how the, if there are other jurisdictions that are not taking that into account if it's within a certain period of time that they get set aside thank you for that I know that's a lot to respond to in a little <laughs> bit of time Megan and I want to note that that last question was from our the chief public defender in Miami so thank you for that question um great well I, I also know that we are at time so don't feel bad about cutting out if you need to go to your thing but I, I want to try and answer these questions as, as best I can um so first of all in response to to Felix I think that's a great point I mean so let me clarify first I am not coming here endorsing a consequentialist cost benefit rationale to detention. I'm not saying that that's what we should do. I'm saying that these are the this is the rationale that people are giving for doing it. And so we're going to and we're going to take that rationale seriously and apply that rationale and see does theory match practice. Um but if you do take that rationale seriously, you know this idea that the government has the authority to to lock up anybody who's, you know, for whom that, uh, you know, that that results in like net public benefit, you know, the benefits outweigh the cost. There is absolutely no conceptual reason why that would stop in the boundaries of somebody who has been arrested. It would stop at the pre-child detention boundaries. And I, I don't know if you've read uh, Sandy Mason's paper, um, it's called Dangerous Defendants, that is basically making that same argument. There's no conceptual limitations on that, if so. And if so, that, that you know, that has some scary implications, you know? 19 year old men, by the way, young men out there, you guys are at high risk statistically of committing crime. You know, there's, there's very few things that criminology can say unambiguously, but 
young men are at high risk of statistical, you know, st high statistical risk of crime. So what do we do about that? Do we lock up all, all 19 year old men? Uh, you know, is, is that ever permissible? Any, well, some subset of 19 year old men, some, you know, 19 year old men that are, I don't know, in, in fraternities, <laughs> uh, you know, obviously this gets very creepy. This gets very, you know, um, very dystopian science fiction novel, but at the same regard, to the extent that that sounds dystopian science fiction novel, this idea of, you know, locking people up based on their, their age and their gender, you know, if, if we weren't so used to a system that locks people up pre-trial, maybe that would also look, you know, dystopian science fiction novel. I mean, it does to me after having looked at it for a while. That's how I see it as very dystopian science fiction novel, despite the trade-offs that I, you know, that I discussed previously. All right. Um, second question about uh, some detention that lasts for, for two or three days. Um, so, you know, absolutely like it's, it's tricky, you know, it's, I, you know, I, I think in the realm of kind of reforms that people are considering, you know, like at least the, you know, among the more progressive or the more transformative reforms still often involve some short, you know, periods of detention for some limited group of people, uh, you know, before they can really have the time to meet with their public defender, to build some defensive arguments, to find out what evidence the prosecution has, to kind of engage in this, you know, this inquiry in a deeper level. Um, and that, you know, the two or three days that it can take before that happens has a bunch of different costs, you know, and I'm just talking direct costs, you know, like we begin how, you know, who's willing to spend two or three days in jail? Who's willing to say that that's no big deal when you're thinking about it for yourself? Nobody. It's a huge deal. It's a big deal. Nobody wants to go to jail. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, I mean, in terms of you mentioned a study. I don't know exactly what study you're talking about in terms of whether two or three days versus, you know, zero days are going to make a big difference in terms of later things like FTA or recidivism. I, these types of questions, in my mind, there's a lot of studies out there that you shouldn't learn a ton from. Like there's just, it's it's a difficult question to answer really well. I, I take most studies with a grain of salt, um, but that's that's me as a researcher. I don't. It's hard for me to advise you when you should believe something or or not because I think it it does take a little bit of knowledge um, of the methods in order to evaluate them. Uh, okay, Carlos. So um, when you're talking about FTAs not being intentional, you also talked about monitoring and accountability. So I I, I might have missed a beat here in terms of. Uh, where you're going with it. So I'm just going to take a stab and hopefully I, I'm kind of roughly addressing your, your question. If not, I'm willing to, to kind of follow up on you with you. Um, so first of all, to the extent that FTAs are not intentional and the goal is still getting people, you know, in court, um, you know, there's, I think there's, uh, you know, the, I think that and the thing people tend to talk about is text message reminders. You know, if it's, if it's not intentional, um, helping, helping get the information to them about where they're supposed to be, uh, in a in a kind of timely manner, making the information easy to access, uh, you know, giving them reminders, uh, helping break down the barriers that prevent them from being able to get there. Um, you know, these these seem like kind of common sense uh, solutions. Uh, but you also brought up the entering the issue of monitoring and accountability, which is stuff that I talked about mostly in terms of reform. And so there, you know, my the point that I was trying to make uh, had to do with you know, say you, say you have some some pretrial reform. Uh, most of the time, reform is still going to grant some discretion to, you know, to the judiciary. Um, and uh, it, it, when it comes to this type of re reform, just simply giving them presumptions, as I said, I don't think that's going to be terribly effective. I think judges tend to want to keep doing what they've been doing. And unless there's, you know, um, uh, you know, it, unless there's some kind of some some kind of teeth to the policy. They're they're generally not going to to be able. You know, they're not going to. They're going to they're going to take that this sort of non binding suggestions and uh, generally uh, tend to ignore them. Um, the the monitoring and accountability that I was proposing here or, or mentioning here is, you know, if part of the reason that people can get away with ignoring strongly worded laws about presumptive default and so forth is because oftentimes there's just no information about what they're doing. You know, so there's that's that's the first step, you know, just saying, oh, by the way, the presumptive default, you allowed some discretion and maybe theoretically you thought presumptive default meant like, 
oh, well, we do it 80% of the time and we override it 20% of the time. That's what I would think kind of sounds like abiding, you know, complying with a presumptive default. If it's really we override it 70% of the time and follow it 30% of the time, that's a very different story. You only know that by monitoring. You only know that by, by tracking, by making this stuff public. Um, and then, so that's that's one step. And then the second step is accountability, you know, to the extent that, um, you know, judges are 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 not complying with with the spirit or even the letter of of the law. Um, you know, to what extent is there are there ways that that you know there's there can be accountability measures to ensure um, you know to ensure that they do and to ensure that they are. And those you know those can range depending on on the state or the place and what's practical. You know, just simply from electoral accountability, <laughs> uh, reappointment accountability to uh, you know kind of uh, other potential solutions as well. Um, so I don't know if I got it at your point here, if I missed it, but I'm happy to follow up if you, if you want well, to. Well, thank you for going so over time with us <laughs> and for all of the really useful information that you provided here. And I know um, we'll be putting this on the recording online, as well as any of the resources shared um, and the slides that you uh, so generously provided so that we can have those available for download for folks um, in a follow-up email. Uh, and just thank you for your time and for your research. And we'll look forward to seeing that uh, preview paper when it's published. Great. Thank you. Good to chat with everybody. I don't know if there's anything I missed in this, this chat sequence, but. Um... I think we just got a, a late coming comment um, about from the former policy director at the Innocence Project about how education and training behind for the reasoning behind reforms may influence judicial decision making um oh okay yeah generally fairly limited amounts yeah well thank you all for your participation and uh we'll see you hopefully again on october 12th all right thanks for chatting it was fun to have a conversation with y'all bye-bye goodbye